so good stuff. So uh, Hunter, uh, what, what what neck of the woods are do you call home these days? Where whereabouts are you? So I'm in Toronto, and this is where you know RDP Associates is is headquartered and has been over the past you know 32 plus years. Yeah. Um, but me myself, I mean, our office is in the financial district. But me myself, I'm around around the Queen West area in Toronto. Oh, cool. So, yeah. yeah, you're right in the fi- like close to the financial district. You're you're downtown where all the action is. So that's good. that's right. Except we're all working from home right now. So yeah, a little different than usual, of course. So a little, a little more spread out for sure. Yeah, that that's definitely a different dynamic. And uh, you know, before we get into the topic, and this is like a big one. Uh, I know a lot of founders, tech startup founders, I'm sure tech startup founders are really interested, especially in this environment we live in in Canada, around tax credits, government grants, subsidies, et cetera. Before we jump into the nuts and bolts and, and the shop talk, so to speak, let's just kind of warm up a little bit. Like, uh, I always like to kind of just throw something out there. You know, what what are you up to lately? It's summer. Uh, we do record these and we release them later. So people might watch it in the fall. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know what? What interesting things have you been up to this summer? I, I wish I had some good stuff to report yeah. to you, to be honest. But uh, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, everyone's aware. But Toronto's been a little bit uh, slow in terms of reopening a bit, right? But yeah. uh, you know, at least you know patios have been open for a little bit of time. So at least I've been able to go out and you know have dinners and things like that on patios. But to be honest, other than that, there hasn't been much travel for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, but I do have two English bulldogs, and you know, you might even hear them throughout oh, the, awesome. the period of this. But um, yeah. I have two English bulldogs. I'll you know take them on you know walks, bring them in, in the park, and things like that. <laughs> yeah, I'll make sure that I show them. Uh, you know, at the end there, of course. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, just taking them out, trying to enjoy the weather when I can, getting out as much as possible. That's about it. Cool, cool. Right, were, were any of those uh, a COVID puppies, or did you have them before? No, I had them before. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I've had them for about, so I mean, I, the first one's three and a half um, and then the other one's uh, five and a half. So I've had them for yeah. a bit of time now. Yeah. Are they uh, like, are they the type of dog that one walk a day is enough or are, are they more of a high? Because I think the bulldogs are more of kind of, they're like a napping dog, aren't they? Oh, they're, <laughs> they're a napping dog. You'll hear them nap. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes even you have to push them for one walk, to be honest. But, uh, really, yeah, yeah. you know, if you get them to, you know, the, the, the waterfront and things like that, they get excited. They can go for, you know, a decent walk. But right. uh, certainly they're not like, uh, you know, most other athletic dogs that can go right. for, you know, multiple walks a day. They're good for, you know, short ones a, a couple times a day and we're good. So they like to like save up their energy, but like on, keep it on reserve, right? For, yeah. for what? I don't know, <laughs> yeah. but they certainly do save it. Absolutely. For quality REM sleep. They're, they're, yeah. they're experts at REM sleep for sure. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Cool, cool. So uh, have you picked up on any new series or anything? Like a lot of people are binging Netflix and different things. Any any hobbies pop up uh, with the whole dynamic change we've all been living through? Uh, you know, one of the biggest things, actually, I'm not sure if you're into, into it as well, but and I'm sure a lot of people have seen it, but Drive to Survive. It's about F1. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I'd never really been interested in F1 prior to this, but uh, it captivated mm-hmm. me a little bit. And uh, ever since then, I've been super passionate about uh, getting into, you know, like watching F1 and kind of the flow yeah. of what's happening. So yeah. that's been kind of an interesting one for me. Okay, cool. Yeah, I actually wrote it down because I'm not familiar, but F1 is becoming more and more interesting to me just with some of the parallels around team and stuff like that and just, you know, how a whole F1 thing works. Um, it, yeah. It's just fascinating to me that like a pit crew, we talked about that in another interview I did, can be a matter of seconds, shading seconds off of uh, off of a yeah. racer's time, right? And, and yeah. just all the stuff that goes, the technology that goes into it and well, that's pro- the, the process, thing. right? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about like one of the biggest things that I get to do is hear all about different, you know, uh, Canadian companies working on various technologies. And, yeah, yeah. you know, Formula One is, you know, kind of a pinnacle of, you know, advancing technology in the automotive industry, right? So right. some of the things that they're working on uh, in, you know, not only their like power units, but their aerodynamics is it's pretty wild. So it's interesting to see for sure. Yeah, cool, cool. So uh, you represent RDP Associates um, and kind of an interesting backstory. You and I uh, were introduced, uh, I think maybe my accountant introduced me to you, but um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, shout out to Greg. Um, (laughs) And and so uh, I was looking into, for myself actually, uh, on on a venture I'm involved in for for shred financing or S-R-N-E-D as it's properly 
said, and we'll unpack that a bit. And, um, you know, it just, it, it occurred to me, and this was, I was a little late to the game on it. Um, I thought, you know, there's so many founders out there that it's their second career, or maybe it's their first time, you know, launching a startup. And there's so many new things to learn. And there's a lot of focus on product and development and go to market strategy. But a lot of companies die because there's a cash burn and there's a lack of funding. Uh, you know, funding for development resources, et cetera. And what's really unique about Canada is, is these programs that we have, these, these grant programs and, and these tax credits. So that will be something that we unpack. But, at, you know, maybe before we get into that specifically, um, can you talk a little bit about RDP Associates? Uh, give us, you know, the 30, 60 second elevator pitch on what they're all about, what you guys specialize in. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah, so we've been around for 32 plus years now. So we 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 were created as a consultancy, you know, in the mid 80s when the SRNED tax credit was really kind of coming to fruition. Um, but if I were to give it to you in a nutshell, essentially what we do is we get Canadian business, and now you know as we've evolved, um, you know, UK business, Ireland businesses, essentially we access government funding for them. Um, and it's not usually you know any government funding. So like you know we kind of stayed away from you know, some of the uh, the CEWS and things like that. And, you know, we, we let, you know, our partnerships with accounting firms kind of take that over. But really what we specialize in is obtaining, um, you know, SR and ED tax credits. So the scientific research, experimental development tax credit, shred for short. Uh, and then, you know, government grant, for, uh, accessing government grants as well for technology companies, right? Um, so a lot of the, the Canadian, you know, government grant programs are centered around, you know, innovation, research and development and things of that nature. But essentially anything with a really complex um, application process is where we shine. So Shred right. is certainly one of them, um, requires a lot of technical uh, involvement, technical know-how. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where we come in as a consultancy. We overtake the processes of applying for these you know, um, tax credit and grant programs and ultimately get funding for Canadian businesses. Very cool. Yeah, and it's, it's a lot to navigate um, because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people, it's like a DIY project, they try to do it themselves, but... Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, but but I can attest as a as a as a fellow founder uh, myself, having gone through it, it's it's a lot to navigate, especially with all the other things you have to focus on to keep the company going. Um, I think it's well worth engaging with a, a company like RDP for that expertise because uh, you really don't know what you don't know, right? Um, right. And and so, do you have uh, specifically like a, an expertise or an area you focus on and? Maybe just give the audience a, a bit of background. How, how did you get into this anyway? Like, did you, did you study for this, or like, was it kind of one of those things? Like, because like, if you're in the insurance industry, like me, nobody plans to get into it. We just kind of, of all end up here somehow, and then we stay, yeah, right. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I studied commerce in university um, out in Halifax at St. Mary's University. So I obviously, you know, had a little bit of background there. But um, cool. the reason I got into it is, interestingly enough, it is a family business of ours, right? So it oh, was my okay. dad that created it in 1987. And so originally it was, you know, a, an accounting firm, Cooks and Walker. Um, but it evolved throughout the years. And Shred was such a large component of what we were doing that it kind of grew into its own business, right? So you know, naturally, I got slightly involved back in probably around 2009, I would say. Mm -hmm. And throughout the years, I just kind of got more and more involved in it to the point where I just took on a bigger role. So, you know, my role here is essentially not just business development, but also, you know, helping the companies understand and align them with the right programs and kind of kick off that process, right? So a lot of what we have to do is, is, is understand, you know, what is a company working on so we can determine what are the grant programs that we should be applying for. So a lot of my expertise will fall really kind of industry agnostic in, in the tech space. So it wouldn't right. have to be just, you know, in insurance technology, but mm-hmm. software as a whole, um, everything from clean tech, uh, you know, manufacturing, things like that. So that's yeah. the, the, the best part about my job, I'd say, is, 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 you know, getting to see all the different types of companies and what they're working on and making sure that we're aligning it with the right programs. A lot of variety. That, that's a really cool story. And I, I like that you've got like a family business foundation there that you've launched into. And so you can understand some of the struggles that people are going through um, and, and appreciate that. that. That's a really cool uh, story, you know, what got you here. So let's talk a little bit about like Canada specifically. Sure. Because, uh, you know, our, our audience is global, but uh, right. but we appeal to and we focus on, you know, the Canadian marketplace first and, and trying to encourage innovation 
that starts here and then grows and flourishes into something else that could become global, could become multi-market, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of great talent here in Canada. Um, yes. So, you know, it's part of this is building the awareness around, okay, the talent's here. Um, you know, we've got a unique insurance from insurance space, you know, very consolidated industry. So smaller number of decision makers, but then comes the funding part, right? So can you talk a little bit about what you think makes Canada unique that maybe the average Joe like me wouldn't know about? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one of the things, if I were to kind of relay it uh, in, into the, the government grants or government funding side of things is that we literally have hundreds of programs that are incentivizing something and we'll, we'll give out grant funding. So it's a unique opportunity because if you look at, for instance, the UK, you know, they have innovation grants, but, you know, they're, they're very kind of specific and, and numbered, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas Canada has a wide variety of different programs. So it's really unique in that sense. What that does, though, is also provides a little bit of a challenge of understanding what's the right grant program and what should you be taking advantage of. But the thing I like the most, I'd say, in terms of if we're looking at it from a startup perspective, is that the grant programs are slightly tiered, I would say. So what I mean by that is, you know, some of the lowest barrier to entry with the least red, uh, least red tape in terms of accessing these grants would be like the hiring grants, right? So hiring for STEM related positions. So mm -hmm. an example, if you needed a new software developer, maybe a recent graduate for an internship, you know, there's grant funding for that um, throughout the year in different, you know, at different times. And, you know, for you know, all you need to be is incorporated in Canada and you can start to apply for these grants to gain access to maybe 25, 30,000 uh, to pay against, you know, somebody's salary throughout the first year. Right. So as a startup company, I mean, this is non-dilutive, you know, funding, non-repayable mm -hmm. funding, which can really kind of go a long way for startups. So, you know, these are the types of things that are accessible very early on in a company's stages. Um, and okay. from there, it kind of grows, right? So as you, you know, as you scale with more full-time employees and generate more revenue, um, it opens up the world of, of grant funding to, you know, even higher funding amounts, essentially, for things like research and development to advance technology or advance maybe the state of your software, um, enhancing the capabilities, all the way to expanding into new international markets outside of Canada. Um, so, you know, it kind of works up from you know, some coverage for, for startups, but it kind of scales along with the company in terms of incentives. You know, once you start to generate a little bit of revenue, there's other opportunities to expand into new markets, you know, yeah. perform R&D and, and, and constantly innovate. So there, there's such a wide variety of grant programs. I think that's pretty special. Um, and, and, and the interesting thing about uh, Canada, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that's really... Um not just unique, but that's critical information you just shared because um, I think going through the process, a lot of founders may naively assume that they can't afford a full-time developer or they can't afford a certain type of resource and they have to wait um, or they can't even get their MVP to market because they think, okay, well, you know, I, I you know, I either got to go the contractor route or I need, I'm pre-revenue and I only have this seed money or this bootstrap money that I've self-funded or gathered together somehow through the couch cushions. And, um, you know, that piece around reaching out to an expert to understand where can I access those things is, is, is critical. And that's where I think, and I hope that this goes beyond just the insurance audience we have a lot of just people that are connected in the tech community. And would you say that like, if you had to like give it a score from one to 10, what would you say is like the average awareness that these things even exist? Like the STEM positions that you had referenced as an, as an example, does the average founder that you run into even have any sort of awareness around there on a scale of one to 10, where would you place it? I'd say it's 50-50, but, yeah. um, you know, to get more granular with, with why I say that, I mean, there's awareness that there's grants out there, yeah. but a lot of times, you know, when I speak with the company, they'll either kind of be approaching it in, in a slightly different manner that, that may not be conducive to getting that grant, um, or they, right. they might be placing their efforts on grants that ultimately don't make sense to apply for, uh, for, for them specifically for their projects, right? 
Um, so it, it's very rare, and certainly there are companies out there that have done a great job internally. Um, you know, some some of the companies I've spoken with, some you know, some of them are fairly large, and they have you know grants, teams, and things like that. Um, but you know, it, it is a lot of it, if you're to try and look at all the different grant programs that are online, mm-hmm. it would take you a long period of time, and right. not all of them are extremely clear as to how the process works and what types of projects they're funding. Right. And to kind of streamline the process, and I, I tell people this all the time, like step number one is just understanding what the right program is for you. Um, yes. and, and this is you know something that I typically um, will do over even just a 20 minute phone call. Mm-hmm. And you know, whether or not you want to use our services for, for overtaking the process is, is, is one thing. And that's fine if you didn't, but at least we're able to, you know, over a, t- a short phone call, just explore and say, Hey, here's, here's the opportunities that are there for you. Instead yeah. of having you go down a huge rabbit hole of trying to figure out what's up, what's out there, and spending a lot of time on it, and maybe ending up in the wrong place, right? So, yeah, um, you know, there people know that there's grants out there, but um, you know, to they don't always access them all the time, and it's it takes a long period of time for sure. Well, and, and that discovery process, if it's self-led, could take months or even yeah. years versus reaching out to someone like you uh, who could, you know, through a 15, 20 minute call could probably assess and say, okay, well, I know the program you need to apply for. Yeah. Um, and uh, speaking of programs themselves, what what are the top like three to five that you see most commonly or that you prescribe on a regular basis, I guess? Well, what I'd say is in, in, instead of not listing specific programs, I mean, which I can do for sure, and there's sure. a couple in my mind, but um more so based on like what the projects are pertaining to. So what I mean by that is like the three major categories of grant funding or, or what types of, um, of grants that are out there for specific types of projects. So research and development is one. So if a company you know, has a future R&D project, so let's say that they're kind of advancing the capability of their software, they're going to incur costs to do so in Canada, right? Yeah. There can be government grants um, to fund a portion of that project, right? Um, you know, then that, that's one kind of areas R and D or advancing technology. The second is hiring, right? Mm-hmm. So if you know a company is looking to uh, to scale, gain more employees, there's uh, various different programs that you know essentially assist with that. And this could be funding amounts anywhere from twenty five to maybe fifty thousand dollars, depending on the program that we're looking at. Mm-hmm. And again, these are hiring into kind of tech related positions or STEM positions. Um, and the third category is export marketing. So, it, you know, uh, there's a big push for Canadian companies to expand into new, to new markets and generate uh, more export revenue. So there's also funding for the marketing associated with expanding into new markets, you know, sometimes up to $75,000, right? So those are the three kind of key areas that there is grant funding. So R&D, hiring, and export. Yeah. But I'd say if I were to pick, you know, maybe three programs like SR and ED is a tax credit. It's not a grant, but that is one of the best, most important programs in my opinion. And the reason why is because um, for a Canadian controlled, you know, private corporation that's incurred costs in Canada for research and development. So AKA, you know, like labor costs via T4 salaries or or contracted costs, they can get back in between 40 to 60% back on the, back on the dollar spent on eligible R and D costs. Right. And that that's refundable. So if you're not liable to pay corporate taxes, that goes straight to the bottom line, which is incredibly important and useful for uh, any company, really, but specifically in the startup yeah. stage as well, right? right? So the Shred program is really, um, really important and, and something we place a lot of our focus on. Mm-hmm. Um, if I were to pick two grant programs, I'd pick IRAP, which is the Industrial Research Assistance Program. So again, federal program incentivizing research and development. So it can cover in between 50 to maybe 80% of project costs for R&D. Um, and last but not least, can export. And that one is, is to help Canadian businesses expand into new markets. Um, so Shred, IRAP, and can export would be my picks for now. But yeah. um, you know, I think the, the, it's worth mentioning that these incentives change all the time. I mean, those three programs have been around for a long time, but um, you know, there's new incentives that pop up every year. Um, sure. April's a great time to look at this because that's typically when a new federal budget gets released. Yeah. And new incentives come, old ones go. So it's always good to keep your finger on a pulse, uh, on the pulse, and, and see what's new out there. But those would be my three picks for now. Have you seen any? Uh, we're, we're actually in, the, in an election cycle right now, as we yeah. speak. 
Um, yeah. So have you seen any great programs uh, scrapped uh, under new governments um, or is it typically new ones are born? I would say like for now, new ones have been born. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that we're in a time obviously where we're trying to sort of, you know, get through the tail end, hopefully of a pandemic, but we're also mm -hmm. trying to stimulate a whole bunch of different things, you know, after, you know, the past two years of, of COVID-19, right? right? So we've seen a couple of new programs pop up that are incentivizing, you know, job creation and expansion and things like that, which are pretty good. Yeah. Um, you know, each side will have their own, I guess, a thought process of what they change in the incentive world should they get elected. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we'll see how it happens based on the election, if anything gets changed. But if you look at the history in terms of um, Canada and the grant programs, they've always been fairly steady over the past, uh, you know, 20 to 30 years. Um, right. And it's really kind of been an uptick mostly in terms of the grant programs that are out there. So I always feel fairly confident there's going to be um, not so much scrapping good programs, but creating new ones. Which is encouraging, right? That it's kind of government agnostic or political party agnostic to a certain extent. Um, and, and I hope it stays that way. We're, you know, we're talking about a country that was built on small business entrepreneurs, right? So yeah. uh, it's important that we create that environment where, where they can thrive and survive and, and bring their products to market. What are some myths that you come across on a regular basis? Do you, do you get people calling you with some funny <laughs> ideas in their head that they go, oh, I thought it worked this way or, you know, um, funny ideas for sure. I mean, you, yeah. sometimes you hear some absolutely amazing novel ideas that are extremely, you know, incredible to hear about. And sometimes you hear some, you know, some crazy ideas that are you know, just as fun to hear about, of course. But sure. um, I wouldn't say, you know, myths, so to speak, but maybe misconceptions is a, is a better word. Yeah, just like about how it all works kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. of course. I think that the common misconception is um, that a lot of companies will, will take a look at grants backwards. And what I mean by that is sometimes yeah. I'll get calls or emails where somebody says, hey, I'm looking for 50,000 in grant funding or 100,000 in, in grant funding. And the reality of it is, is that the grant programs are actually not there. I mean, they are there for the company. Of course, it's there for the company, but they're created because the governments or different government agencies are looking to incentivize areas that they're trying to incentivize, right? Mm -hmm. So they're trying to promote technology advancement. They want to see, you know, Canada be competitive by creating new technologies, by hiring more people, by increasing, you know, revenues via export sales. And it shows because those are where the government grants, that's what the government grants are typically incentivizing, right? Right. So it's really about actually aligning with some of the governments, you know, what the government wants to see. So instead of, you know, uh, saying, oh, I need $50,000. I mean, the grants just never work that way. They're always a mm -hmm. cost sharing model and each one will only cover a percentage of a project cost. Right. So an example is if, if your R&D project costs $100,000, the grant program would say, well, we'll do one-to-one -one matching. So we'll give you 50% if you're approved. So you get $50,000. You can't just request and say, I want 100,000 for my 100,000 project. It just never works that way, right? Yeah. So that's a common misconception that I see is that um, instead of going with what your requests are, you need mm -hmm. to take a look at what the government's requests are and see if you can align your future projects with those. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say in terms of the application process, that's a, a great way of approaching it. So you want to be expanding on, you know, if you did get this grant funding, what happens, right? Mm -hmm. So is it going to increase your revenues? Is it going to create the ability to, um, to hire more people and, and, and create more jobs? Is it going to help you be competitive internationally, expand into new markets? Those are all really great things to discuss or, or, or to outline um, in a grant proposal to yeah. increase the likelihood of getting that funding. So I'd say the common misconception in short is, you know, um, approach it, uh, you know, people will approach it backwards saying we want money. Um, and it, mm. it should be kind of, you know, if we get that money, here's what we can do that aligns with the government's, you know, programs initiatives. Right. And are there any, uh, would you say, disqualifiers uh, where, you know, you see on a regular basis, people come to you and you automatically know conversation stops right here, full stop. We can't go past this point because you have not met X, Y, and Z, and it happens on a regular basis, just to build that awareness of, 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 of amongst the audience, whoever might be watching. Of course. Yeah. Um, well, if we, every program is a bit different. I mean, yeah. but obviously it has to happen in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the project needs to be Canadian if we're accessing Canadian grants. And, you know, even the SHRED program, right? So 
a question I get a lot is, hey, you know, I have a, an employee doing R&D for us in America. Can we claim that? And the answer is no, those costs cannot be claimed under Shred, the Shred program. So it needs right. to be Canadian, um, you know, and, and that makes sense. Obviously, these are Canadian incentives. Um, each program works different in terms of uh, eligibility. I'd say the most common one is revenue. Um, and it is, a, it is challenging. One thing I would say is, there yeah. are startup grants. Um, I do wish there was more because I think that you know startups are in such a, a volatile phase, mm -hmm. and the grants are would be so, are so important. So there certainly are grants for startups. Yeah. But um, you know when you start to get to the larger funding amounts, like for R and D and uh, international expansion, mm -hmm. um, the, the grant programs typically you're going to want to see that you have at least a hundred or two hundred thousand in revenues on a recent financial statement to show, yeah. um, before you can actually apply. So, you know, not all grant programs are like that, but some of them. So um, pre, being in pre-revenue can be challenging, but it certainly does not disqualify from the hiring grants and things like that. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, they'll take into account for the larger grants, your company's, you know, performance over the past, yeah. you know, two years, how many full-time employees you have and things like that. And so just to kind of get the lingo right here, there is a difference between tax credits and grants. Shred yeah. is a tax credit, correct? Correct. It's not yes. a grant. Yeah. And so, and Shred is the one or SRNED um, and not Shreddies, like the cereal. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is like the common buzz term people throw around without really knowing what it is. And uh, some people like, you know, think they can claim it as revenue or an expense. And I think there's diff I'm not going to get into accounting treatment on that. Um, but that's one as an example, since we're talking about startups and being pre revenue. Um, someone can apply for that tax credit and be pre-revenue as far as I understand. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's the best part. So the grants are a little bit more, for lack of better terms, maybe a bit finicky, right? So there's yeah. a little bit more maybe red tape um, in terms of the eligibility. And again, this is something that we can determine for a company, you know, so and this is part of what we do is just understanding, you know, what the right programs are based on where the company is and what they're doing. Right. Um, but this is why the Shred program is, is so good in this, in this fashion is that you could be, you know, as long as you are incurring costs and the technical work that you're doing, like the research and development, you know, qualifies as what we call shred as, you know, scientific research and experimental development. Yeah. Um, then, and, you know, if you're incurring that cost, it's a tax entitlement. You are entitled to get a percentage of that back. Right. Yeah. So it, it's a really great program. And again, because it is refundable for Canadian private owned companies, mm -hmm. I mean, you can get that, you know, right back to the bottom line, you can reinvest it in hiring more people, doing more R&D and, and grow. Cool, cool. Um, is there, because you see a lot of this, especially in the gig economy that we kind of are growing into right now, there's a lot of outsourcing to like independent contractors. Is there, you know, with some of the more common ones, and I know I'm generalizing a lot so just stop me when i when i do because you're the expert not me i'm just the guy <laughs> asking the questions but um it, is it more advantageous to have an employee um and do you have a better chance getting approved for a lot of these versus having contractors um and then i have a follow-up to that after you answer the question yeah of course so, well it's a yeah. great question to be honest i mean so uh, there is a key difference between the two and it doesn't lie with the technical work because a contractor, a Canadian contractor can do just as much eligible, you know, shred work as a T4 salaried employee. Got but it. the key lies with the percentage that you can claim. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, if you have T4 salaried, you know, uh, R&D staff working on R&D throughout the year, um, you're able to claim 100% of the eligible cost, plus you can claim overhead. Um, and, you know, there's a proxy method, which can automatically increase this by 55%. Okay. So in example, you know, if you had 100,000 in, in salary, you can just say it's 155. And then we'll do our calculations on that. When it's contracted, you can only claim 80% of eligible costs and you mm. cannot claim overhead. So you cannot mark it up by that 55%. Got it. So you're roughly looking at losing half of the claim size if you're claiming con Canadian contractors in comparison to T Ford salaried you know, software engineers or, or R&D staff, essentially, right? So um, T4 is always better. You're going to be getting more money back. Um, one thing to note, Canadian contractors needs to be Canadian. Um, even if the contractors, uh, you know, one thing to look at is if the contractors then contract it out. So even if it's a contracted company that then contracts it out outside of Canada, that would not qualify. Needs to okay. be Canadian contractors happens in Canada. So you gotta know your you gotta know who you're working with because uh, there might be situations where someone 
is dealing with a contractor that is domestic here in Canada and they're subbing work out without the client's knowledge potentially. Um, so it does get that involved as far as following the path, like who's actually doing the work at the end of the day. Um, did, did I get that understanding absolutely. right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 Judging by the head nodding and on yeah. the audio version, of this, <laughs> no one will see that. Um, so I just wanted to clarify. Uh, that was part of my follow-up question actually, because a lot of this stuff, there are a lot of services out there where, you know, you've got a quick request needs to be done and, you know, you go through an app and, you know, you can hire highly technical resources uh, to just do something like, I need you to program this in my web. I need you to write this code or do whatever. And that resource though might be in another country. Um, right. and, and, and like, but the service again that you're using could be domestic. Um, it's just, they're contracting that work out. So do those types of, I don't want to name names, but there's a few that are really, really common that most people are probably familiar with. Uh, are those kind of disqualified then, uh, because they're not Canadian resources, just the, the, the way we understand it. Yeah. So essentially, yeah, uh, like in short, if you use a Canadian contractor that then uses foreign, um, you know, employees to do the work, it would not qualify, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. And, you know, CRA does have ways to determine that, you know, if they do, you know, decide to audit, um, they can find that. So for sure. Well, and, and it, it just, it comes down to, I think, due diligence, right? So yeah. um, if you're going in and you're expecting to get qualified for any of these programs, you got to ask a few more questions before you, you hire these people on. Yeah, for sure. And I think that the key thing also with Shred, like there's um, not to get too you know deep into the rules and things like that. But if you're ever using a contractor, it's always important. It's like um, CRA never wants double claiming on the same work, right? So the question yeah. becomes is if you're using a contractor, who gets to claim the Shred? Is it the contractor company or is it you who's contracting them? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, there is, you know, a little bit more to discuss in this area. But the long story short is if you have in your contract with them that you get to claim the Shred, that makes it 10 times easier because contractually, there's no question about it. You get to claim the shred. So if there is ever any kind of a, a, contract, a contracted work where you're, say, hiring a, a software developer to do some advanced you know, development, and you think that they're, you know, the shred tax credit is something that you're going to want to explore, you can just put that in the contract with them as well that you'd like to, you'd like to claim that. Okay, great. Um, kind of closing off, you know, I call this my, my, my pot of gold question is like, I think there's, there's a lot of well-intentioned people out there trying to invent new things and create new things. Um, and I have to imagine though, there isn't a bottomless pot of gold that's limitless. Um, and I'll just use the legal term statute of limitations it probably doesn't apply here, but is there some sort of limitation period around, okay, I, I am, you know, making some sort of scientific research or economic development. And I've, I've met those criteria, um, but it is like a, a virtual clock ticking at that point where it's like, if you don't bring this to market in three years and start paying taxes to the CRA, you're not gonna qualify um, because companies can stay in that pre-revenue stage for a long time um, yeah. because they might be creating something that's you know really complex. Yeah. So actually, the Shred program is really good about this, okay? So there's yeah. actually no limit on the total amount of funding that you can receive from them. You know, so if you had, you know, multi-millions of dollars of R&D spend, yes, there's different calculations. So you start, you don't get the full maybe 40 to 60%, but you start to get a lesser percentage. But theoretically, it, it is a limitless um, program in terms of funding. Yeah. Um, so And that's how it's different from the grant programs. Grant programs have a certain amount of funding every year, like a budget every year that they are going yeah. to give out, you know, and it might be closed that, uh, you know, in, in, out of funding. Shred's not like that. It's year round, um, year over year, and it's to do with your taxes, right? So it's going back right. and picking up costs. But um, in terms of the specific question where it's like, hey, if you don't, if this doesn't get to market, no concerns like that. Um, yeah. The biggest thing is, is because like what is Shred eligible is more so about like the scientific or technological uncertainties and how a company is trying to overcome those. That's the key thing. Um, right. And, you know, it's really about the underlying technology a company is building. So um, failure can actually be a good thing um, for SR and ED. Um, so it, it's a really not too much limitations in relation to that. The limitations start to, to be where if you're a private company or foreign controlled company operating in Canada, 
There's different rules where it's no longer like a refundable tax credit. So it has to be applied to taxes owing. Um, And and then that's when it starts to lose its benefit. So, you know, publicly traded companies and foreign controlled is there's times where the shred program isn't as um, as beneficial. But when you're a CCPC, like a Canadian controlled private corporation, if you're doing eligible work and incurring costs for it, it's a really great program. And, you know, I say that, you know, the, the, the process is challenging and can be mm-hmm. frustrating for some you know companies there's, there's no two ways about that but that's where we come in as a consultancy is to try and remedy those those frustrations overtake the process so a client doesn't have have to and essentially um you know get back more money in an easier process so and, and i can attest you guys are very hands-on um, <laughs> so i don't know about your competitors none of them have reached out to me yet so i'm yeah. giving you guys kudos uh you know you heard it straight from the horse's mouth so that was uh, it was a great experience for for me personally. Um, and so, just on that note, uh, as far as like I talked about limitations, um, you know, lots of people might be three, four years down the road and find out, hey, I didn't even know Shred existed because now I watched the Insured Tech Canada podcast, and oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> I got all these credits that I could have applied for. Can you go back, or is it only the current fiscal year? So you yeah so it's you always do technically go back. I mean, so when your fiscal year is done, like it's submitted with your corporate taxes, um, and yeah. you know if you've already submitted, we can go back and amend it with a with a shred claim. Yeah. Um, but it's a great question. So you have eighteen months to file okay. from a fiscal year end date, right? Yeah. So an example of that is if you have a December, um, you know, uh, twenty twenty year end, right? Mm -hmm. You have uh, until middle of the year next year to file for all the costs from uh, January 2020 to December 2020. So for that full fiscal year. Um, So there are times you can claim two years at once, um, Mm -hmm. just based on the timing. But essentially, CRA is very strict with that deadline. So as soon as that deadline passes, you cannot claim for that fiscal year. Um, but yeah, you can't claim for future fiscal years for obvious reasons. You haven't incurred right. that cost yet. But yeah, I mean, as soon as your fiscal year end is closed, you can claim back uh, uh, for that fiscal year and 18 months prior. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so if people out there are, are watching and listening, we've given them enough information to get interested. Uh, much like cutting your own hair, you shouldn't you shouldn't apply for your own tax credits and subsidies. <laughs> you, you should hire hire a professional to do it. Um, it's probably well worth what you the ROI you're going to get in return. How do they find you um, on, online or otherwise? So I mean, uh, you, they can take a look at our company. We're just at www.rdpassociates.com. And even if you just Google RDP Associates, it'll obviously come up. Um, you know, everybody can feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Obviously, I'm on LinkedIn. Cool. Um, uh, and those would probably be the, the easiest ways to get in touch with me. Um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, you, you can always take a look at, uh, you know, all the, all the grant programs that are out there and, you know, reach out to us with any questions or we're, we're very happy to help in terms of having quick meetings and just kind of, uh, determine, you know, what's out there for a company and, and, uh, establish a good kind of framework of how we'd access them going forward. So, yeah. Right. And, and you know what, I can attest that, you know, if you don't qualify now, it's still worth the conversation because yeah. in a subsequent year, you already made the connection and you know who to reach out to at that point, right? Absolutely. So. I mean, the, the biggest thing is, you know, complete open and honesty. Some some companies, there's, you know, we have meetings with them and there's just nothing yet, you know, and, yeah. and that's fine. At least we've kind of crossed that bridge or, or, or taken a mm-hmm. look at that. Um, but it's all about keeping in touch. You know, the biggest thing in terms of grant programs is is timing. Um, yeah. That's the key difference between tax credits is instead of applying after the fact, you're applying prior to a project starting. So the more information that we know about a company, if they, you know, you know touch base with us and just let us know what's happening, you know, then we can you know provide them with the right advice and the right programs to access. So, right. yeah. Cool. What does RDP stand for, by the way? We didn't, we didn't talk about that. And I'm curious now. <laughs> it's uh, research and development professionals. Oh, cool! Awesome. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Just in case you know, fanatically, people didn't catch the RDP. There you go. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Guys... I almost forget it because nobody ever asks us. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I could edit that one out if you if you forgot it. Just edit, you know, like you say like, no, no, like, we're good. Like Richard, David, Patricia, or something like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nothing, nothing like that. But uh, yeah, and it's yeah. not not named after the dogs, right? Speaking I of wish. the. 
Speaking of the dog, are the dogs around? You want to bring them on before we close oh, up? There, one's in one's in its crate, and the other one's sleeping near the door. I purposely tried to get them as far away as possible so you didn't hear them snoring. So uh. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed. They behave for the entire podcast. So like I've the got first a, time it's happened. So <laughs> I've got a yappy dog, which is why I do these at the office. So so yeah, next time I'll I'll, I'll look for some bulldogs. That's awesome. Good stuff. So this was really fun. Hunter, thank you for sitting down with me. Uh, Hunter Cookson, once again, from RDP Associates. Really appreciate This is really informative. Uh, we are planning on releasing this uh, before the upcoming ITC and SureTech Connect conference. Um, and, you know, we've got a growing following on social media. Um, so you'll get lots of mileage out of this interview. And uh, I, I know a lot of founders will benefit from just knowing that this is out there and that there's an expert you can reach out and talk to. So thanks for your time sitting down with me today. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, maybe we can start putting our heads together and thinking about maybe a follow-up conversation. Uh, who knows under the new government, we'll, we might see some changes uh, in the coming years and months. So uh, more to come on that. Absolutely. Sounds cool. great. Oh,